let's uh, get started. I'm going to be quick because um, then it's beer time. Actually, then it's raffle time, then it's beer time. So we have nothing left in the evening but win. Um, I'm Rob Kaufman. Uh, the company I work for is, well, the company I own is Notch 8. Um, so that's what my slide marker is for. Uh, you can see here that my email address and website, my slide share account, which is where these slides will be after the talk, and my speaker rate account, which you're welcome to rate me on, um, and then last, my uh, Twitter handle. So uh, let's talk about being busy. Uh, this is a light day for me. I usually run nine desktops um, using spaces. I frequently have two or three projects open, uh, which are those windows in the bottom right-hand corner there. Um, you can see that th this presentation is open. There's often some sort of Word document or something open in one screen. I've got chat. I've got browsers. i am just got a lot going on all the time. Um, and one of the things that I'm really passionate about is keeping my tools sharp. Um, and for me, a lot of that is about automation and about taking all those little things you spend five minutes doing every time you do them or two minutes doing every time you do them and driving them out. Um, I think getting your workflow, uh, improving your workflow is incredibly important. Um, all those little frustrations, all those things that drive you out, drop you out of the zone and keep you from being as productive as you could be um, should be eliminated. Um, we talk about continuous improvement on our projects all the time and in our companies, um, but that should also start and focus on the individuals. Um, and I think that to be successful, you need to schedule regular time to sharpen your tools and to work on those little niggly things that are bothering you or maybe aren't as efficient as they could be. Um, I like, you know, Friday afternoons is a great time for tool sharpening or Monday mornings, uh, just because those are two times when maybe you're not as productive as you would be otherwise anyway. Um, and so if you're doing something that's a little more fun or that it's kind of immediate positive feedback, uh, it's easier to get in and, and make those things happen. Um, kinds of things to do that, you know, what I consider sharpening my tools. Um, learning uh, new plugins, either um, browser plugins or plugins for your editor or Rails plugins, looking up how a new Ruby gem works. Those are all kinds of, you know, um, things that you can do that maybe the things that you're learning about you don't need right this minute. Um, but, you know, later on in a month or two months or three months, you're going to go, oh, hey, I already know the solution to this problem and uh, cut yourself down on some research time there and possibly come up with solutions to problems that you would have never thought of if you didn't know that that thing existed. Uh, learning your tools. Um, I am particularly nomadic when it comes to my text editor. Uh, I did uh, all of 2009 in Emacs and um, about six months in them. Uh, right now I'm using Sublime Text um, and loving it. I just, I'm always changing and tweaking my workflow. Um, it's something that I'm really passionate about. Um, updating your software, just making sure that everything's at the latest um, point. One of the things that's really annoying to me is that so much of the software we use now just randomly pops up updates whenever it freaking feels like it. Um, I hate that. I take Fridays, and Fridays is when I sharpen my tools, and that's when I do all my software updates. And so if you interrupt me in the middle of my workflow and ask if you want, can update Firefox for the 15th time this month, uh, I'm just, I instantly know that the answer is no. And on Friday, I'll go and say, okay, check for updates. All right, install that update. Um, and I think that that's really useful because there are so many possible interruptions you can have in a day that anything you can do to drive some of those interruptions out is really uh, worthwhile. And by having a time when you do it, they don't just get put off for in until infinity or until your machine gets hacked or until like, you find out that you're on Firefox 3.0 and Google's talking about stopping supporting Firefox 3.5 now in August. So um, you know, it's important to keep up with things, but also it's important to get something done. Um, and then scripting stuff. I script so much of my workflow. Um, I'm uh, fairly notorious for going in and saying, oh, you do the same thing every time, therefore let's script it, and just getting rid of whatever that is. Um, and that's important and powerful um, for a couple reasons. One, because then you're not spending your time doing it. And two, because the machine, the computer, is incredibly good at doing the same thing over and over again consistently. People are not really that great at that. We forget a step. We you know, go down the check block, check mark, uh, checklist, and check everything off and only do six out of the 10 steps. Yes? Yeah, the computer's also really good at doing the wrong thing, so we can put something in the program that you don't necessarily want to find it. How do you handle that? 
Sure. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the things that I'm automating are things that with immediate feedback. Uh, for instance, when I start my laptop, I have no pro programs that run automatically. You know, that little OSX thing where you can say, you know, start this program when the machine starts up, all of mine are off. Because every once in a while, I want to start up my machine and do something really quick. Like, for instance, if I had to reboot before this talk, we wouldn't want to wait for uh, Chrome to load. We wouldn't want to wait for ADM to load. We wouldn't want to wait for all that stuff to happen. So I have a little startup script that I run that um, basically I intentionally trigger um, that brings my system up to current state. It opens my browser. It opens my text editor. It sets up my terminal. It does all of that launching. And those things are immediate feedback. Like I know when one of those is broken because it doesn't work right. Um, for things like, um, oh, a good example is my very first job where I was an intern. Uh, my computer still runs in my old cubicle. And somebody else has that cubicle now, and they have their own computer that they use. But in the corner of that cube, uh, going on 10 years later, uh, the, my machine still runs. And the reason is, is it does a whole bunch of automated reporting uh, that's all scripted in Windows using WinBatch. And it just does it automatically every day. And yeah, those things do break, right? There, there's, fr there's fragileness there. You know, programs update and change where the UI, UI well elements are and that kind of thing. And uh, you have to, um, well, I mean, it's like your backups, right? Your backups are worthless if all you ever do is backup. If you don't every once in a while go in and try and do a restore, all you're doing is making paperweights. Um, and your scripts are like that too. Um, but a lot of the things that you're automating are things that you can you know, go in every once in a while and say, yes, this still works. Um, now, scripting, the testing of your scripting, I don't know about that. That's a little meta. Um, many people have said this. Uh, I learned it from Scrooge McDuck when I was a little kid. Uh, and you do. You want to work smarter and not harder as much as possible. And a lot of times, that's what automation is about. It's about greasing the wheels in your workflow so that you're focusing on the things you care about. Uh, so the first tool that I'm going to talk about that I've recently discovered um, that's helping me a lot is this tool called Heroku-san. It's a Ruby gem. Uh, I use Heroku to deploy a large portion of my customers' applications. Um, and one of the things that Heroku's built-in tools don't do well is handle a single uh, repository of code being deployed to multiple Heroku applications. Um, now, why would you want to do that? Well, the very first obvious reason is maybe you need a deployment environment that you can share with other developers, a staging environment that you can test code that you're getting ready to go to production, and a production environment. Um, specifically, those last two pretty much should always be there. right? You don't want to just automatically go live um, one of the pitfalls of working with Heroku is frequently your de uh, develop software developers, Rails developers, are using MySQL on their local boxes, and then they're pointing to Postgres, and they are not the same. Uh, and those little edge cases will get you. Um, not every day, but frequently enough that it's really embarrassing. Um, and uh, so it's nice to have a staging server where you know whoever the um, customer of that feature. Uh, whether they're internal to your company or somebody external, whoever you know, uh, cares the most about that feature can go in and verify that that's working in staging before you roll it out live. Um, and that's a big important part, I think, of um, a real production-ready workflow. Um, and Heroku-san helps us do that. Um, you can see that there's a whole bunch of commands that are almost big enough to read on the screen. Um, but uh, the big ones are uh, rake deploy. And um, this, what I'll show you next is this uh, concept of Heroku environments. Um, one of the things about Heroku that's really cool is you can push your, you will push your Git repository just to Heroku, or, or Heroku remote, and all of a sudden your app's live. Uh, but that doesn't do any other steps. All it does is put the code up. Um, so, for instance, if you need to migrate your database, those migrations may or may not remember, you may or may not remember to run them. Like it's a separate command. And Heroku-san automatically runs all the migrations every time you do a deploy, uh, which is nice. And it also, by having this rake deploy uh, workflow instead of just doing a git push, you're um, leaving yourself a place to hook in additional functionality. Whatever other little steps your specific use case involves can be put in that rake task and done 
every time by every developer instead of occasionally by the one dude who remembers. So uh, we can see uh, on the right-hand side a, a larger um, or a very, fairly simple production and staging environments. We say the name of the app. Uh, we have any additional config and environment variables. Um, and uh, when we do the, um, if we do rake production deploy, it does, uses the production variables. If we do rake staging deploy, it does the staging variables. Um, I use this on one app that uh, has a single code repository that's deployed currently to seven different uh, applications. Um, there are just white labeled versions of the same fundamental code. Um, and you can't see here, but this uh, scrolls on down for about uh, another four applica defined applications. Um, and the rolling out a new one is now defining a new environment, to set the variables, putting in uh, an entry here in Heroku-san, and then just sending it up to Heroku. There's room for improvement. Uh, there's always room for improvement. One of the things that Heroku has done is their Heroku tool has a plugin functionality. And uh, there's a Ruby Gems like site that has those Heroku plugins. Um, I think that that's kind of terrible because they don't live with your app, right? So different developers are going to have different tool sets um, and you're going to have problems there. Um, however, this Heroku San Gem could be improved to do a couple things that I'm starting to need to do more frequently, um, and they're sort of on my list of things on one of those Friday afternoons to get done. Um, and that's uh, being able to declare which branch to, to deploy automatically to which um, Heroku uh, remote. So, for instance, so currently with Heroku, when you do a push, you say, you know, uh, get Heroku or uh, get push Heroku master and it always sends master unless you declare it otherwise and when you do uh, rake deploy it always sends master uh, unless you tell a commit equals and then say the name of the commit you want the branch you want to do and it's one thing that uh, if you ask Ben here that I forget to do what about once every week once every other week and so I want to automate that out because I want to stop forgetting. And uh, basically what I do is I accidentally deploy master to our staging environment instead of the branch that should be staging. And then it's uh, basically blocked until you force clear it. So um, you know, I want to get that out of there so that I don't have to remember what the command is. I want it to be as simple as possible. Um, and then also uh, if you have, uh, one of the things we're starting to see is customers want to have their own Heroku accounts. So they have their own credit card and are being billed directly by Heroku instead of being billed through Notch 8. Um, and in order to do that, there's now two Heroku uh, accounts that I need to have access to on the command line. And Heroku makes it really easy. There's a credentials file in your home directory that you just change. But that's still not easy enough because now I have to remember to change that file whenever I move from one app to another. And uh, that's something that I want to automate out also. Uh, Git flow is sort of a set of workflows for doing uh, Git branch management. Um, something that we've talked about uh, over beers a few times with various people uh, here at SC Ruby is uh, how do you manage the branching? How do you deal with like the day-to-day -day grind of living in a Git repository? Um, Git flow gives you a set of uh, recipes and instructions and tools to do that. Uh, this is an incredibly intimidating diagram um, that uh, sort of demonstrates all of the possible functionality of Git flow. I'm going to break out of my slides here for a second and talk about um, a little bit simplified version. Um, Oh, hey, that's actually not bad. All right. I was worried about never being able to get that large enough to see. Um, so commonly, you have um, sort of a master branch in your repository and a staging branch uh, that you deploy to staging um, servers. And then uh, you make branches for each feature you're working on. Um, and that's sort of the Git flow uh, relies on that underlying convention. Um, so over here on this side of the diagram, we're showing just sort of a straight, these are the actions that a developer is trying to do, and these are showing sort of the state of the repository at that time. So we can see here that we start with uh, all of, you know, the master and staging are the same. 
uh, and we create a branch for a feature. Um, and we would do that by saying uh, git flow uh, feature create, and then the name of the feature, uh, which in this case I guess would be feature one. We make some commits, and then we can uh, sort of finish that feature and merge it back into our staging branch, and then take it up to staging. And a customer can come in and say, yeah, that looks great, or no, that's not quite right, or you know, whatever needs to happen there. At the same time, we can be working in parallel on feature two, uh, which is sort of a separate, if you see here, we started at A again. We have a separate tree of what's going on code-wise. Uh, they make some commits there, uh, and then merge back in. So now H represents everything from feature one and everything from feature two. We send that up to staging. And the customer says, yeah, that's great, or oh no, you need to make some more changes. And then we merge that into production and deploy to production. It's a pretty simple workflow. Um, and by using Git Flow, what you're doing is you're telling all of the developers in your team, hey, this is sort of the structure that we're going to use. Uh, you know that the feature branches are all named very consistently. And um, it's a little bit, it takes care of doing things like rebasing for changes in master and handling hot fixes and other patches and, and sort of eliminates some of the complexities. One of the things about Git is it's incredibly powerful, but is also a little bit confusing. And there's so many different things you can do with it. Um, so Git flow hides a lot of that by automating it. One of the things this workflow doesn't do um, that I've been thinking about a lot lately is uh, link my project tracker tickets directly with my Git repository. And it doesn't uh, allow me, and this has really been a killer for me, uh, to send specific features up to production um, that aren't necessarily all of the features. Right? We would do a week's iteration. You get you know, maybe 15 features done in that week, uh, 45 features if you have been working on it. Um, and uh, then some of them are ready to go live. And a lot of times what happens is you have all that stuff merged in in a way that's very difficult to sort of pick and choose which features you want to send up to production. Um, and there'll be some tiny handful of the features that are super urgent and have to go now, and some handful of features that aren't quite baked and ready. And now you're making a trade-off. Do you spend two hours sorting through commits and trying to pick out, cherry pick which ones you want? Or do you send everything up and just quickly fix the bugs as quick as you can after the deployment? Or do you hold off and wait? You know, and you're working furiously on a Friday afternoon instead of playing around with your tools. Um, so I recently found this uh, repository called Gitmine, which uh, we use Redmine for our project tracker and sort of integrates. Uh, a Git, it's a different, separate flow from Gitflow, um, but integrates the tickets in with um, the repository. So here, to start work on a new, a new feature, we would say you know, git branch and then the name of the feature. It goes out to our uh, ticket tracking system, Redmine, and says, you know, Rob is working on this. It's now in progress. And this is the branch that tracks that and gives you a link in the ticket. Um, you make your commits. And then when you're ready, you can stage that individual branch, um, which copies it into staging. You set a whole bunch of those up and then put it out in staging. Um, and then uh, you can, what is, you know, oops, that's not the right command here. Um, and then you can sort of go through and say, OK, these specific features are the ones that got reviewed. Um, and we're going to push those up to production. We're not going to just push everything. And this is kind of a little more fitting for um, what's becoming my more typical case, where I need to say, OK, features, we worked on features 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, 2 and 4 need to go to production. And 1, 3, and 5 need to go back to get a few more tweaks or have a few more changes before they're ready to go live. Um, so let me show you that real quick. Uh, you'll notice that this is on the, the link I put here is for Notch 8. Um, this is my branch of this project. The staging uh, version doesn't fit the workflow of the guy who originally wrote this, and so isn't in that uh, version of the repository. I did send a patch request. We're still working out exactly how that's going to look ultimately. So we can see up here that the flow for actually working on the features in the beginning is very much the same. 
Um, but what we gain down here towards the bottom of our graph is we deploy to staging, and we're at H here, which is, it has both feature one and feature two in it. Um, and then they say, you know, feature one isn't really ready to, for production yet. We want to go back to the drawing board. Maybe we thought it was going to be really great to use uh, this animation everywhere on our site, and we you know, push really hard to get that, and, and that turns out it's, it's really terrible. Or you know, maybe it's there's uh, an API that got broken during the week, or maybe it's just that the code isn't uh, exactly a perfect representation of what they wanted. Um, and so what we do is we can make a new staging branch. We just blow away our old staging kind of haphazardly, and then pull in the tickets features we do want uh, to be part of it and push those up to staging and test them, just feature two in this case, and then roll that out into production. And later on, when feature one is ready, it can get merged back into staging and then eventually merged into production. So one of the complexities to developer workflow is there are almost an infinite number of possibilities, right? Like this tree could look 100,000 different ways. Um, and so one of the things that I really encourage you to do is to look and see what other people are doing. Um, I really think that Git Flow, even though it doesn't fit my particular use case, is a great place to start. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have wasted all your time talking about it. Uh, because a lot of uh, developers are using it, it does fit the workflow for a lot of places. Um, it just doesn't happen to meet my exact needs right now. Um, and so you know, sort of get a feel for what everyone's doing and then figure out what you need specifically. Um, and then don't be afraid to go off the beaten path a little bit if that's what you need to do. So what about you guys? What are, I wanted to kind of do a little discussion here and, and you know, stop for questions and then also Ask, you know, what are the awesome things you guys do on your, you know, what tools are you using that really make your flow better, help you spend more time actually writing code and less time doing in this trivia and dealing with branch mergers and all that stuff? I know she didn't grab the mic for that one. Um, we have a uh, like a post update hook in GitHub that then just sends a message into Propane mm -hmm. or, or into Campfire, I guess. Uh, so whenever if so, we don't really segregate um, the feature branches from. I, I guess what you say is that that you know feature branches go off and then they come back into a development branch. So everything sort of gets coalesced there and then sorted out from there. Mm -hmm. And from that, we basically just, um, if you're using, I mean, you can use anything legit. You can just make a post, you know, post commit hook or whatever. Right. Um, we just have GitHub set up so it just sends a message into Campfire every time you, you basically make a commit in the development branch or merge in the development branch or something like that. And it just kind of keeps everybody, it lets you get a really kind of snappy pace because everyone's just kind of sitting in, in, uh, in Campfire and, if you see it, you know you can merge in and see the newest stuff. And but it doesn't like it doesn't bother you about it, I guess, which is a really important thing. That it's uh, I'm kind of interested actually how you guys keep manage to keep 45 different features in separate branches or you know well enough that they're easy to merge later. But um, I I don't know. I just found that the more you're merging, the better off you are, and like the 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 quicker the turnaround time is, the better off you are. Yeah, I think that. Uh you, you do spend a lot of, you know, you, you, those branches are fairly short-lived. If you're doing feature branches, for the majority of the feature branches, they're very short-lived. Uh, one of the things that uh, people don't always, you know, good developer habits that I, I haven't really figured a way to automate out um, is rebasing. Like, you should be rebasing from whatever uh, your parent branch is really frequently. Like, maybe you know, once every four hours, maybe every time you commit. It depends a lot on what the pace is uh, upstream, right? But if people are merging in features all the time, you want to be rebasing all the time. Um, and something like a post commit hook to whatever your chat system is, is a really great way to know when you need to rebase. 
uh, without actually going in and disrupting every single developer every time somebody wants to push. Um, there's, a, there's a fine balance there between communicating enough that everyone knows what's going on, right, and communicating so much that no one ever gets anything done. Um, and I think that you're right, that, that those sort of uh, integrations with whatever you're doing for group chat is, is really um, a very uh, powerful tool. We use Pivotal Tracker to great success. Yeah. So when my, the guy who's running the show who doesn't actually program says, hey, do you think you could add a button here to do that? My reply to him is, put it in Tracker. Otherwise, you just totally get swamped, when, especially if you're developing something quickly. But it seems to work well. It allows you to segregate, segregate tasks, estimate them, kind of figure out if you can actually get here from there based on your velocity. It used to be free. I think they started to charge money this month, but I don't think it's a whole lot. So. There you go. If you're academic, it's still free. So we do waste a lot of time on, in Notice Notes, but what we do use are, are basically post-its on the walls. Uh, so we have a bunch of walls, and we have like a war room, and we have a bunch of projects, and we have kind of a big team. So we have like a, toz, a dozen people working, and we just get organized by having all the tickets, and we are organized with what's in the backlog, so the small backlog, what's coming up, this iteration, and we have what's in progress, uh, what's in test, and what's done. And um, that kind of helps us. Yeah, almost every uh, ticket tracker kind of system uh, is trying to emulate the fidelity you get by having you know, a whiteboard with a bunch of lines drawn on it and then a bunch of post-its stuck to it, right? Um, and and I, honestly, something of, there's something really serious about that visceral go up to the wall and move a ticket when you're done with it feeling um, that's really hard to capture with a remote team. Uh, it's, it's very much a challenge, I think. Um, I know while I was out in Wisconsin working at the Getty office there, uh, we implemented a physical wall, um, and it, it, within days, had surpassed every other effort. You know, they had spent months with the, this kind of tracker and that kind of tracker and this kind of, you know, and nothing had ever really worked well before. And even though we were spending, you know, maybe two or three minutes every day syncing it up with the corporate overarching system manually, uh, it was totally worth it. Um, but then winter got real serious and people stopped coming into the office every day. Uh, turns out when there's three feet of snow, you just don't want to go into work, so you work from home. If you can, uh, that got completely behind and really messed up. So I think that uh, ultimately some sort of you know, real virtual board is going to be the answer, but I, there's something about that physically going up to the board and changing it that's really hard to reproduce. I was told that there's a virtual wall called Zendesk. Mm -hmm. um, I think Zendesk, I'm not sure now. But that, I don't know. What's, what is it? Agile Zen. Agile Zen, yeah. Yeah, Agile Zen got bought by the people who do Rally. Um, I don't think they're taking new customers right now. Um, it was really disappointing because we'd found it and got really excited about it. And uh, Rally is what Getty uses uh, globally for all their development. We're like, yes, they bought this company. We're going to see you know, Agile Zen in, you know, integrated into Rally, and it's going to solve all of our problems. Uh, then we realized that the purchase had taken place in like early 2009, or late 2009, and it was still you know, no one, no peep from Rally about the finished acquisition and all of that. So. But yeah, I, there's, there's an almost infinite number of options out there for that kind of As far as uh, cool tools to keep my workflow in check, I actually try to have as few of them as possible, and I try to update them as infrequently as possible so that I'm learning as few APIs as I possibly can. So you'd rather spend the time in a point-and-click interface to track issues or whatever than trying to get that on the command line, is what you're saying? Because then you'd have to learn one more command line? You know, a lot of times that would be true. I mean, it would be just, you know, I hear you saying, you know, you're the kind of person that, that uh, scripts uh, 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 script stuff as soon as as soon as you can to improve your workflow, mm -hmm. and th uh, I would I think the alternate take that I'm getting at here is just to wait a lot longer until it starts to get really annoying, and at that point then I will actually resort to scripting stuff. But up until then, because I just don't have the I don't have the bandwidth to think about those things, and it costs uh, effort to to learn an API and to learn and to think about how to script this meta stuff. 
Sure. Uh, I like to keep that cost to a dull roar as much as I possibly can. It's, you know, if you want to step back and look at it from economic terms, right, like it's how many five minute a day times does it cost to, you know, do you, when, when do you make up the one hour it takes to script it? Um, and, uh, and for each individual thing, you have to make that trade off, right? If you uh, are really fastidious about your scripting, uh, then uh, you're right that that can, you know, if, if it's a six hour job for you to script something, then that's going to be, you're just going to have to be a lot more annoying before it's worthwhile. Um, and I, I totally can see that. But I, and I do encourage you all to make that trade off, right? Like you have to make that decision. Is this worth doing or is the amount of time I'm going to burn doing it? You know, um, you will find that if you go in my bin directory and you look at all the little scripts I've written, they're in about 100 different styles. Uh, one of the things I try and do to leverage my, uh, my time that I spend sharpening my tool is the time that I spend doing these scripts is trying different programming styles and, you know, learn something else while I'm doing it. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, a good little experimental sandbox, too. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, but yeah, I, I, I totally see where you're coming from, like you minimizing that effort. Like it, it's, it's where's the time trade off. Yeah, and um, it's just a matter of degree. I mean, I do this too. Yeah. It's not, yeah. Thanks, it's cool to hear you uh, talk about that. Anybody else? Thanks, Rob. Cool.